thanks so much for your introduction and thanks everyone for joining us today to talk about one of my favorite conditions to manage in clinical practice, which is chronic diarrhea, which I know sounds like a gross weird thing to love. Um, but, you know, what I really love about uh, managing chronic diarrhea is the detective work that goes into it. Um, there's so many distinguishing characteristics for how diarrhea presents and its patterns. And if you can learn to read the, the, tea, the gross tea leaves, you can actually really help patients and help them very quickly. Um, and I find it in many ways easier to figure out than chronic constipation, which we, I think, as dietitians have a lot fewer tools to manage. So hopefully by the end of the session, you will feel more expert, you'll feel like you have a little bit more insight into where to start when somebody presents with chronic diarrhea, because we are going to talk about the most common medical causes um, and those pathophysiologies, so mechanistically what's happening um, for those different types of diarrhea. Uh, we'll talk about the etiology um, and how it actually shows up in terms of symptom and the clues that you can be probing for to figure it all out, including how, what to be looking for when you do a food and symptom recall, which is sort of a key part of our detective process, and then all the different types of dietary and supplement interventions that we as dietitians can bring to bear to help our patients manage chronic diarrhea um, that are not medication-based. So no talk on diarrhea would be complete if we didn't start off with a beautiful visual of the Bristol stool chart, which if you work in this space, you should know well. Um, you know, chronic diarrhea really kind of is referring to the types of stools that are sort of in the five to seven <laughs> range of the Bristol stool chart um, and happening sort of not as random one offs, but really as kind of very frequent um, or even as somebody's only or baseline type of pooping. Um, you know, clinically, the definition of chronic diarrhea is that this is a symptom that's lasting for at least four weeks, right? Like acute diarrhea would be something more like I got a bug and I had diarrhea for three days or for a week. Chronic diarrhea is, you know, happening for a month or longer. Um, and it's happening more than once a day. It might be higher volume. It's, I mean, it's so funny. They say like over 250 cc's a day. Like that means anything to anybody. Like I have no idea how many cc's of poop I put out per day. And I don't imagine our patients do. Um, and, you know, another way to think about diarrhea is sort of like a stool that is so malformed that like if you pooped into a container, the stool would take the shape of the container. Um, and I think it's important to understand that your patients may use the word diarrhea to refer to things that aren't actually clinically diarrhea. And that's why it's really important when someone says, I have diarrhea, that don't just take that at face value. You want to say, like, what do you mean by that? Like, what does diarrhea mean to you? Because sometimes they'll use the word diarrhea when they actually mean urgency. In other words, I wake up in the morning and the urgent need to poop is what gets me out of bed in the morning. But when they go to the bathroom, the stool's actually formed. Right. And that might mean something really different than like a liquid stool. And so you want to really understand, like when they say diarrhea, do they actually mean just urgency without diarrhea? Do they mean that they might kind of get really crampy and have to run to the bathroom again, but the stool might not actually be loose or unformed? Sometimes they say diarrhea to describe sort of like an IBSD type of pattern where in the morning between waking up and 10 a.m., they're back and forth four or five times to the bathroom, you know, and they're kind of just going really frequently. But it's not, again, necessarily diarrhea. It's just kind of what we would call, we call that hyperdefecation or just pooping a lot. Um, that's kind of like more than four times a day. And then for many people, those four times are in a really short period of time in the morning. Or they might use diarrhea to refer to sort of like a soft stool, like maybe sort of like more like a Bristol number five, which has some form to it. And again, that might be something really different than a Bristol number seven. So when someone says diarrhea, I think the bottom line is you as a dietitian, can you describe like, tell me what that means to you. And if they get kind of weird and cagey, like give them some suggestions, like, you know, how many times a day do you go? What do your poops look like? Are they liquid? Are they soft blobs? You know, does it look like you know, fluffy, like fluffy poops that kind of, you know, uh, evaporate into a cloud when you flush, like ask them. And once you kind of show them that you're comfortable getting kind of gross with the lingo, like they will actually give you the details um, because it's really important. The devil is in the details with all of GI stuff and managing chronic diarrhea is certainly no different. 
Um, so we're going to really be focusing today on chronic diarrhea, not acute diarrhea. And we're going to talk about sort of five main mechanisms. We're going to talk about osmotic diarrhea, secretory diarrhea, functional diarrhea, diarrhea caused by kind of pharmacological reactions to food compounds, and also medication side effects. We are not going to be talking about acute diarrhea that is of an infectious nature, um, and we're not going to be talking about food allergy type of stuff. And so this is the scope of today's talk. So let's start with osmotic diarrhea. So the word osmotic comes from the word osmosis. And if you guys remember back to eighth grade biology, what is osmosis? It's when, you know, there is a high concentration of small molecules in a space um, with a semi-permeable membrane and water is attracted from an area of um, lower concentration of dissolved solutes to higher concentration of solutes. And so, um, because your gut lining is a, a semi-permeable membrane. If you have in, say, your colon, a lot of tiny little molecules that are osmotically active that draw water in, tiny little sugars like lactose um, or even like, you know, amino acids or, you know, these small little molecules, there's a lot large concentration of those in the colon, then they will absorb water through the semi-permeable membrane of the gut and then kind of flood the colon, for lack of a better description, and draw that water in and cause a looser stool, a more urgent stool, a watery stool. So it's literally osmosis happening in the gut. The One of the more common causes of an osmotic diarrhea is maldigestion of certain carbohydrates, and this can be primary or secondary. So a primary carbohydrate intolerance is something that you're pretty much genetically programmed for. In other words, this is just how your body is wired, that genetically you are programmed to become lactose intolerant in your teenage years or your 20s. And so at some point in late childhood or adolescence, you stop producing a lot of lactase and then you become lactose intolerant. So you do not break down lactose. It stays in your gut. It lands in the colon. It attracts lots of water from all that unabsorbed lactose. And then you get an osmotic diarrhea from lactose intolerance. The same exact mechanism of action is at play with sucrose intolerance, which primarily would be caused by a deficiency in the uh, disaccharides sucrase isomaltase, which I think when I went to school, you know, not that long ago, like we were kind of taught that that's sort of something that is always caught in childhood. And, you know, we would never see that in adult practice. And that's not true at all. Um, sucrase isomaltase deficiency or SID affects about 1% um, of the population, uh, which is a similar prevalence to celiac disease. Um, and it affects about an estimated 10% of people who have been given a diagnosis of diarrhea predominant IBS. In other words, it can be an IBS mimicker that is actually not IBS, but it is a carbohydrate intolerance. Um, fructose intolerance. This is not an enzyme deficiency, but rather a low expression of the receptor, the GLUT5 receptor in the small bowel, which is responsible for transporting fructose from inside the bowel that you eat into the body so it doesn't stay in the bowel. If you don't have a lot of this transporter, but you eat a lot of fructose, you will exceed your capacity to absorb it, and you will have a lot of malabsorbed fructose that ends up in the bowel as an osmotically active particle drawing water in. We can also see, you know, those first two, the lactase and sucrase deficiencies as secondary to damage to the small intestine. In other words, the cells that make enzymes have been damaged often by celiac disease or Crohn's disease from that inflammation. And temporarily, you're not making enough of that enzyme because of the damage. And so you get these sort of secondary carbohydrate intolerances, which can cause a temporary form of osmotic diarrhea that once your celiac disease is well controlled or your Crohn's disease is in remission, generally speaking, those cells grow back, they start making enzymes again, and that's not like a permanent feature of your diet digestion. Um, and often sort of new onset lactose intolerance can be an early sign of celiac disease. And so that's something to have on your radar screen. Everybody malabsorbs sugar alcohols or polyols. No human beings absorb them or absorb them very well. And so anybody who eats enough of these will develop an osmotic diarrhea. And if you read the product reviews for sugar-free gummy bears on Amazon, you will get all sorts of very graphic and colorful um, detailed explanations of what that looks like for unwitting consumers of too many sugar-free gummy bears. Um, 
high dose magnesium and high dose vitamin C also cause, you know, osmotic effects in the bowel, which is why we use them as laxatives, right? Like using magnesium at doses of about 350, 400 milligrams or more will be malabsorbed and be an osmotic laxative. Miralax is an osmotic laxative. And so there are purposeful uses and lactulose is an osmotic laxative. These poorly absorbed molecules that will draw water into the bowel. And so that's how some laxatives work to help people with constipation. Um, people who have dumping syndrome, which is um, an often a side effect of like a like a bariatric surgery or, you know, a gut resection uh, will experience osmotic diarrhea because they're, you know, if you eat too much sugar at once and you just don't have enough length of intestine or enough enzymatic activity to, to break down and digest that sugar, then that will cause an osmotic rush into the bowel. And that dumping syndrome is what that's called. And short bowel syndrome, again, if you just lose a lot of surface area of intestine, there is a lot of malabsorption of various sugars and carbohydrates and food particles that can cause an osmotic load that then draws water into the bowel. So these are all osmotic diarrhea. That is mechanistically how it works. Um, sidebar about sucrase isomaltase deficiency, if it's not something you see a lot of in your practice, there's two ways that it is diagnosed if this is not something you're familiar with. There is a very specific type of breath test called a carbon-13 breath test that you can order um, online from a uh, a lab called, I want to say metabolic solutions, um, and they will send it to your patient directly. They need to know your patient's height and weight to calculate um, basically the way it works is they drink some um, carbon-13 labeled sucrose. And if they absorb that sucrose well, then you will see lots of carbon-13 um, carbon dioxide on their breath at a certain interval. And if they don't absorb it well, you're not going to see that radio labeled um, carbon dioxide on their breath. And that's sort of how they would diagnose it by breath test. Um, doctors can also take biopsies during endoscopy from the small intestine and actually measure the levels of enzymes um, in the small intestine. And they can measure lactase, sucrase, maltase, and palatinase. Um, and you can kind of see some examples of what those lab results will look like and what somebody with sucrose intolerance will look like diagnostically. And so if you suspect a sucrose intolerance, you can work with your physician partners or a patient's gastric gastroenterologist to get one of these tests underway. Dietitians can order the sucrose breath test, um, but we cannot order, obviously, endoscopies or perform them, or we shouldn't be. Moving on to the next mechanism of action is secretory diarrhea. So this is a diarrhea that is caused by active secretion of electrolytes into the gut lumen by the cells lining the intestines. Um, and the secretion of electrolytes um, will then kind of change the fluid balance within the within the small intestine and kind of cause more or less fluid, or in the case of diarrhea, more fluid. Um, what causes more electrolytes to be secreted by the gut cells? A couple of things. Um, and so it can be sort of a chemical reaction. And so um, bile salts, this is part of the mechanism of bile acid diarrhea, that when these irritating bile salts arrive in the colon um, from being malabsorbed, further upstream, um, they kind of create this uh, a chemical reaction that causes more electrolytes to be secreted into the gut and therefore more liquid. We can also see secretory be part of an inflammatory process that is triggered by inflammatory um, mediators like cytokines and prostaglandins. And they, again, as part of how they act on cells, it changes the um, the intracellular processes of electrolyte balance and ion transport, and that can also cause decreased absorption of water into the body and increased secretion of sodium into the lumen, which then osmotically draws more, more water in. Um, and both of these happening at once creates a diarrhea. Um, sometimes there can be, you know, uh, damage to the mucosa or scarring that also just um, decreases the functioning surface area of the gut, um, and therefore water isn't, you know, so well absorbed. Um, and sometimes there's secretions of actual mucus or pus, and sometimes we see this with um, inflammatory bowel disease, and that can create a kind of more diarrhea and just like more stuff and more volume um, added to the stool because there's actual mucus being secreted from irritated inflamed cells. And sometimes patients will tell you with IBD, and we see it sometimes even with nickel allergy, um, actual mucus in the stools that can make things very loose and yucky. Malabsorption syndrome is kind of a combination. It has features of both osmotic and secretory diarrhea. And again, the bile acid diarrhea is a really good example of this. Um, you know, with malabsorption, um, 
when we think about nutrient malabsorption, um, fat malabsorption is really the one macronutrient that's most likely to cause um, diarrhea. So if you have like not enough pancreatic enzymes, you might be malabsorbing you know, starches and proteins and fat, but it's really the fat malabsorption that's driving the diarrhea in this case. And why does that happen? Because if you don't absorb enough fat, then the fat ends up in the colon and therefore in, you know, in the stool. Um, and as we know, fat and water don't mix, right? Like oil and water, they don't emulsify with each other. So you've got all this water in the stool, right? Like stool is like 75% water. And then all of a sudden you have these blobs of fat that can't emulsify with the water. So you have this just like unformed, like oil and water, literally like separate, not able to kind of create a formed stool. And that's fat malabsorption, that's called steatorrhea. And that's why a lot of the time patients with steatorrhea or with, you know, pancreatic insufficiency will actually say that they see like an oily sheen in the toilet water um, because there's literal oil that is not being emulsified into this really high water content stool. So we'll see this primarily with pancreatic insufficiency. You can with severe celiac disease that's been going a long time, if there is fat malabsorption, you can see like a steatorrhea, you can see it with short bowel syndrome. Just again, there's not enough surface area for the fat to be absorbed because the bowel is so short. Um, so there are many reasons why people could have a steatorrhea. Um, and then bile acid diarrhea kind of has these features of um, malabsorption syndrome. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the bile acids um, that are malabsorbed uh, in the small intestine, travel onto the colon. Um, if you know your body just genetically doesn't recycle them well. Um, and they do cause secretions, like active secretions by the colonic cells. And you know, so those active secretions are very stimulating in terms of motility. Um, and you know, we can see this in the case of you know, just genetic predisposition. And so about 25% of people who carry a diagnosis of diarrhea predominant IBS actually have bile acid diarrhea. It is probably the biggest, most common IBS mimicker out there. Um, we see it when people have had their gallbladder removed. Sometimes the liver has a really hard time regulating just how much bile it secretes into the small intestine as part of the digestive process. And it kind of secretes more than the body's able to reabsorb. And so sometimes it'll just be like an overflow there. Um, if there's a resection of the terminal ileum, so the terminal ileum is where bile salts are recycled after the digestive process takes place. And if we don't recycle them very well, then they stay in the colon and they're really irritating. Um, we see with metformin, which is a really common medication used to treat PCOS, prediabetes, and I think sometimes even now for weight loss, metformin can cause bile acid diarrhea. And with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can also cause a bile acid diarrhea because having too much bacteria in the small intestine acts on the bile acids in a way that makes them less absorbable and therefore they are less absorbed. And so SIBO diarrhea is predominantly mediated by bile acid malabsorption. Um, so these are kind of the malabsorptive types of diarrhea that are like a little bit osmotic, a little bit secretory, um, fat malabsorption and bile acid diarrhea. Okay, moving to the next pathophysiology, we have functional diarrhea. So this is, you know, related to abnormal motor, which is motility and sensory processes of the gut. So it's not primarily a structural problem. Like you look at the gut, like its length is fine. Like there's no inflammation there. Like structurally the gut looks fine. There's no inflammation. So it's not inflammatory. Functional diarrhea is really mediated by the types of, you know, enteric hormones and neurotransmitters that govern motility, serotonin, acetylcholine, you know, various endorphins. And so these are just like the type of signaling molecules that tell the gut when to move and when not to move are wonky, they're spasmodic, they're hyperactive, they're, you know, at too high levels. Um, and that can really cause things to just move too fast, sort of like either spasmodic or rapid transit. Um, and it really is this rapid transit that creates diarrhea because if things are moving through too quickly, if the stool is moving through so quickly, it doesn't spend a lot of time in the colon. And what's the colon's main job? The colon's main job is to reabsorb water and electrolytes. So if you spend 50% less time in the colon, then that much less water is being reabsorbed back into the body from the stool. So the stool kind of stays kind of soft and mushy and doesn't have a chance to really firm up, right? The opposite end of that is with slow transit, like in constipation, the stool spends too much time in the colon and too much water is reabsorbed. And then you get those really hard rocks. So, you know, the colonic transit time can really influence what the stool looks like. And so rapid transit is really mechanistically what's happening with functional diarrhea.
This right now is the key mechanism of IBS diarrhea as we currently know it. And I say as we currently know it with a huge asterisk because, you know, I'm just back from um, the DDW conference this past May. Yeah, it was May. Um, and I think that there's a lot of research going on that suggests that there may be other mechanisms at play with IBSD. And so maybe in the next five years or so, when we talk about IBS and what's causing it, it might not just be functional in terms of the motor processes. There may be a role of, you know, mast cells um, and histamine and, um, and sort of like these more um, slightly inflammatory white blood cells that are not currently on our radar screen. And so that might be more at play than we realize. And so watch this space. IBS is, we're constantly learning more about how it works and what's going on there. And it might be more complicated than this, but the current understanding of IBS is primarily a disruption of motor function in the gut, and so we're calling it functional diarrhea for now. Uh, moving on to some of our next, um, you know, reasons for chronic diarrhea, you know, there's certain just food compounds that impact, you know, the bowel. Um, so two of them are compounds in coffee and alcohol. So coffee contains chlorogenic acid, which is a cholinergic or colon stimulating compound. And I want to really bring this up that it is not actually the caffeine that is the primary bowel stimulant with coffee. Your patients will tell you, you know, even decaf coffee will make me have to run to the bathroom, but tea with caffeine doesn't, or Diet Coke with caffeine doesn't make me have to poop because it's not primarily the caffeine. It's the coffee and coffee that has to, that stimulates the colon. And that's actually important also if you're trying to manage chronic constipation, right? If you've got a patient who's constipated and they don't drink coffee because, oh, the caffeine makes me really jittery, tell them to drink decaf. It'll still help them poop potentially. Um, and so it's not the caffeine, it's the chlorogenic acid, and that is present in all coffee, both decaf and regular. And alcohol can cause, you know, diarrhea by a few mechanisms. Number one, alcohol does influence um, the colon's ability to reabsorb water um, or liquid. Um, and also it can have like these sort of like small osmotic particles depending on the variety. So like certain types of beers probably have, you know, a lot more of these sort of little osmotic particles and like tequila, for example. And so certain types of alcohol can also cause a little bit of an osmotic diarrhea depending on what people are drinking. I think rum has excess fructose and fructose, if you're fructose intolerant, could cause an osmotic diarrhea. And so, you know, certain types of alcohol might cause also an osmotic situation. And then we kind of have other food compounds that can cause diarrhea. And one of them that's increasingly on our radar screen in our clinical practice is histamine. So histamine is a molecule that is a naturally occurring molecule. The body, certain cells in the body make it, mast cells and basophils make it. Um, histamine exists in the world. You know, aged funky cheeses and charcuterie and salami are naturally high in histamine because it is a byproduct of bacterial fermentation of an amino acid called histidine. And foods that are high in protein and high in histidine that are aged, cured, fermented will develop histamine. And so certain foods are naturally high in histamine, wine, cheese, charcuterie, things like that. Um, and so, you know, in the, GI, in the body, in the GI tract, you know, histamine has a role in gastric acid production, which is why when some people have acid reflux, they take um, drugs like Pepsid or Famotidine. It is a histamine to receptor blocker. You block histamine receptors, you make less acid, right? So histamine does stimulate gastric acid. Um, it triggers uh, sensory nerve endings, right? Which is why, you know, in some cases, histamine might make you feel very itchy on your skin, right? Because it triggers nerve endings. Um, and in all tissues throughout the body, histamine causes swelling, right? It's why your, your mosquito bites swell up or when you're having an allergic reaction, your lips swell up. That's histamine, that's swelling. Well, imagine what swelling in your bowel might do to you, right? It make you, might make you really bloated. It might make you have cramping. It might send you to running to the bathroom with diarrhea and cramps. So when there is too much histamine in the GI tract, it can cause acid reflux, it can cause pain, and it can cause diarrhea. There's a, a number of reasons why someone might have histamine-related symptoms or histamine-mediated symptoms. Um, and that you know, varies from very medically benign, which is I just ate a ton of histamine at a wine and cheese party and my body's enzymes that break down histamine couldn't keep up. 
that's kind of like lactose intolerance for histamine, right? Um, or like you ate like a really old aged fish that you caught in the Caribbean, like an amberjack or something. And, you know, it had like so much histamine in it. You just got like massive histamine overload. That's called scombroid poisoning. It was probably on the RD exam that all of us forgot about. Um, and so that might just be like a real mismatch between how much histamine I just ate and how quickly my body was able to degrade it in the gut before it kind of created symptoms. But some people are just like histamine making machines, right? Some people who are like allergic to all the pollens and dander and mold and dust mites, their bodies might just be making histamine all the freaking time and be very diarrhea prone. And then on top of that, you eat a high histamine meal, like forget about it. It was just like sent them over the top. Um, and then there's some people with sort of like mast cell disorders where the cells within their body that produce histamine are just overactive. They either have too many of them or they have a normal number, but they just don't stop making histamine. Um, and those people might find that like eating foods that are high in histamine on top of the histamine that they're already producing is just like makes them feel terrible. So there's a lot of reasons that someone could have a histamine mediated disorder. Um, and in those cases, you know, certain foods might make them feel worse or better. Uh, many medications can contribute to diarrhea, um, you know, including some very commonly used medications, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, pantoprazole, like that are super commonly used. Um, a lot of blood pressure medications can cause diarrhea. Um, certain antidepressants, certain anti-seizure medications, metformin we just talked about earlier causes bile acid diarrhea. Um, a lot of medications will have inactive ingredients like sorbitol and mannitol, including some digestive enzymes that are used to treat GI conditions. Um, a very popular brand of a bean digesting enzyme has mannitol in it, which just floors me why that would be the case. Um, and then certain dietary supplements can cause an osmotic diarrhea. So people might not realize that, oh, I was told to take magnesium for sleep or I'm taking it for my migraines, not realizing that the dose that they're taking for their migraines has an osmotic laxative effect. Or, oh, I take like, you know, emergency for immunity and they're taking doses over 2000 milligrams, which can have an osmotic effect. Um, and then all types of like the chewable like gummies and the like and the liquids and, you know, the sublingual vitamins can also have sorbitol is a really common filler and many people can find that that um, causes diarrhea. Also just like a lot of gum chewing, all the sugar alcohols and gum chewing can cause, you know, osmotic diarrhea. Okay. So, you know, if you are kind of presented with someone who has chronic diarrhea and like you can, you know, maybe pause on the recording when you watch this again, if you want to take a picture of this slide or you can take a picture of it now if you want, um, you know, what are you really looking for in a food symptom diary as to clues as to what is the most likely cause of somebody's chronic diarrhea? And I'll just kind of make sure everyone knows the, um, the abbreviations across the top. IBSD is diarrhea predominant IBS. CHO intolerance is a carbohydrate intolerance like lactose, sucrose, or fructose. IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or colitis. Um, BAD is bile acid diarrhea. SIBO, SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. EPI is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, celiac disease is celiac disease, and histamine is obviously, you know, histamine overload or histamine intolerance. And so what you can kind of see, you know, I try to kind of map on the different mechanisms that are at play with these different medical diagnoses so that you can see that IBSD is primarily functional and carbohydrate intolerance is primarily osmotic, et cetera. Um, and, you know, when you're kind of asking or you're presented with somebody's history to really kind of think about, like, what are some things that might clue you in to the type of diarrhea you're dealing with? Like someone who has chronic diarrhea and they also have a B12 deficiency and you're like, well, that's weird. Why would they be B12 deficient? They eat plenty of animal products. You know, certain types of medical conditions that are associated with diarrhea are also associated with a B12 deficiency. So if that's what you're presented with, immediately your mind should go to to Crohn's disease, bile acid diarrhea, or SIBO, right? Someone's waking overnight to poop, that's not IBS, okay? IB, people with IBS do not wake overnight to poop, but people who are malabsorbing, they will wake overnight to poop. And so that's when you're really looking at some of the mal more malabsorptive causes, right? Like a carbon, like if you have a lactose load, like milk before bed, like at 9 p.m., like that's probably going to hit you at like 3 or 4 a.m. <laughs> and so if you're waking up overnight, like, you know, that could be malabsorptive. And so you're looking at carbohydrate intolerance, inflammatory bowel disease, bile acid, SIBO, pe um, pancreatic insufficiency. You're probably not looking at histamine. You're probably not looking at IBS. 
Um, if you have the diarrhea, you know, at the same time each day, it's probably very specific to a food that you are eating at a same time every day. And so very habitual eaters, we eat the same two things for breakfast every day, you know, are really good candidates for kind of figuring out a food trigger if, you know, the diarrhea always happens at like 3 p.m. or 1 p.m. You know, I'm looking kind of like, well, what do they eat at breakfast that maybe is, you know, malabsorbing or something? Or if it's only in the morning and after 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., they never, ever, ever have diarrhea. That's probably more of the hormonal IBSD kind of situation where mornings are always their worst time of day. And so, you know, by kind of understanding a little bit more about how different types of diarrhea present, you'll be in a really good position to narrow down really, really quickly and then start probing around one to three hypotheses and really start to understand what do I think is going on here. So the way that I do that in clinical practice is I have people walk me through a day of their life. If you can get a super detailed 24-hour food and symptom recall and understand what you're actually looking for and what the data mean, the answer is almost always there for chronic diarrhea. So I'm really kind of seeing how a typical day unfolds, like what time are we waking up, when do the symptoms happen, how often do they happen, do you ever have normal poops in between the diarrheal poops? In other words, if you're able to like three days a week to have totally normal stools, it's probably not like a chronic inflammatory process, it's probably something you're eating. Um, whereas if you have diarrhea every single day that gets you out of bed, no matter what you eat, whether you're fasted, I'm not thinking that it's lactose intolerance, right? Like, and so by really understanding the patterns of the diarrhea, you're really able to kind of home in on like, where should I be focusing? Um, you want to understand about the stool quality and consistency, um, like liquidy stool is a really different animal than like somewhat formed loosey goosey kind of stuff. I want to understand, have you always been the kid with diarrhea since you were like, you know, born, like you always had diarrhea and stomach aches. I'm thinking of kind of like a lifelong process, like a bile acid diarrhea or a sucrose intolerance. If it just started four weeks ago and before that I could eat literally anything. And now every time I eat, you know, high FODMAP foods, I'm having diarrhea. I hope we're all thinking SIBO, right? And so like whether this is a chronic or a new onset thing can also be a really important clue. And how does your diarrhea react to different environments? When you went on vacation, was it completely better or was it so much worse? Well, what was different about your diet and your lifestyle in that circumstance where it was better or worse? When you went on a keto diet, were you amazing and perfect? Well, then I'm thinking carbs are maybe your problem. Were you horrible and worse on a keto diet? Well, now I'm thinking fat is the problem and I'm thinking bile acid, diarrhea, or pancreatic insufficiency. So understanding what made it better, what made it worse are really, really great clues. And you're thinking about your fiber balance. You're thinking about FODMAPs. You're thinking about the variability of their diet vis-a-vis -vis the frequency of their symptoms. In other words, if they're really habitual eaters and they eat the same freaking thing every day and their diarrhea is not, you know, corresponding, like some days they're perfect and some days they have diarrhea, but the diet never changes, maybe it's not their diet. Um, and so, you know, these are the types of things that I'm thinking about as I'm developing hypotheses. So understanding that I'm kind of trying to develop a hypothesis and all doctors are telling your patients with chronic diarrhea that they have just IBS. Like, how am I trying to differentiate whether this really is IBS or whether this is something else? Because these things can often look the same on the surface. So one way to tell IBS apart from, say, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you know, they they both present as diarrhea or gas or bloating or pain or, you know, weird food reactions. But with IBS, morning is typically the worst time of day for someone who has diarrhea. Their bowels are really, really active in the morning. Someone with SIBO, morning is often their best time of day because they're fasted. They haven't eaten anything. And the SIBO is like is starved um, when they're so often with SIBO, morning is the best time of day. Whereas with IBS, it's the worst time of day. The other thing that can differentiate them is, you know, taking a litmus test food. For me, that's salad. So someone with IBSD, like diarrhea predominant IBS, often will tell you that salad is not great for them because like all that fiber, that roughage, it's like sends them running to the bathroom. Whereas someone with SIBO is like, salads are really great for me. And why? Because they're low FODMAP. <laughs> um, and so sometimes kind of having like certain foods, having them describe certain foods that are better or worse for them can help you differentiate between IBS and SIBO. Also, IBS really is not generally accompanied by any weight loss, any nutritional deficiencies, where SIBO may be. So these are certain ways that as a dietitian, you can kind of start to tease out whether you think it's one or the other. And also SIBO is often very rapid onset, or even if they've had IBS their whole life, all of a sudden things got a 
whole lot worse. Um, and it felt like I used to be able to tolerate these foods and now I can't, right? So SIBO is kind of like something's different. Whereas IBS is like, and I've been this way my whole life. Um, how do you tell IBS apart from sucrose intolerance? Again, you're looking at these chronic loose stools, diarrhea, you know, often they'll complain of chronic gas and bloating. Um, with sucrose intolerance, if you put them on a low FODMAP diet, they don't get better. Why? Because sugar, sucrose, is allowed and often encouraged on a low FODMAP diet. These patients will often be the ones that tell you when I went low carb or keto, I felt great and even perfect. Um, often they'll know, like, you know what, when I eat too much dessert or when I eat candy, I get horrible diarrhea. Sometimes they'll wake overnight. This diarrhea does not respond to Imodium. Like all that liquid, osmotic diarrhea never responds to antidiarrheals because it's just too much liquid in the bowel. It's not about stopping secretions. Sometimes with um, sucrose intolerance, the stools might be a little bit light colored, tan, orangey. They might burn or feel acidic. And symptoms will not onset right away after eating something, more like two to eight hours. Honestly, more like four to eight hours if we're really being realistic. Two would be like if they were fasted and just like drank like juice or a soda or something. Um, usually it takes a little bit longer for the malabsorbed sugar to get to the colon and cause an osmotic diarrhea. And these patients typically have been the diarrhea kids since childhood. They were the ones that had diarrhea after the birthday parties when they ate too much cake and apple juice or the sugar cereals. So this is why how SID looks really different than IBSD. How do you tell it apart from bile acid diarrhea? You know, honestly, like in clinical practice, you find out that someone has bile acid diarrhea after you've thrown everything you know how to treat IBS with at the patient and they don't respond to anything. You try FODMAP diet, it doesn't work. You try fiber manipulation or fiber supplements, it doesn't work. You try peppermint oil, it doesn't work. You try you know, all sorts of diet manipulation, lactose-free, gluten-free, whatever you try and they don't get better. The doctor prescribes antidiarrheals and you know, antispasmodics and they don't get better. That's honestly how most cases of bile acid diarrhea are found. And then you kind of get to like your wit's end and then somebody thinks of the idea to try them on a bile acid binder medication and within two days, they're perfect. Um, but there are some differences. So with bile acid diarrhea, their stools are generally very, very urgent, even when they're formed. Um, and it's not uncommon for these patients to have accidents like defecation, you know, incontinence. Um, sometimes we'll describe the stools as like really kind of sticky, yucky, tarry, hard to wipe, a mess. They stick to the bowl. Um, so they're kind of like a messy, yucky stool. Um, and sometimes it could onset after they've had their gallbladder removed or starting metformin, but not necessarily. Bile acid diarrhea is absolutely something they could have had their whole lives and just been told that they have IBS. Um, how do we tell it apart from a histamine mediated disorder? You know, often if someone's having a histamine related diarrhea, they're also having other symptoms throughout the body that aren't necessarily just in the GI tract. Sometimes your histamine patients will be very itchy, like on their skin, they might get hives or rashes. They might describe tachycardia. Their heart feels like it's racing when they're having diarrhea. Sometimes they feel like like their swallowing is like kind of tight and, you know, congested. They might get heartburn. They might say they get fuzzy thinking. Like these are all histamine mediated symptoms that are, uh, that can be accompanying the diarrhea. Um, and then they take an antihistamine, like whether it's a Zyrtec or, you know, a Pepsid or a Benadryl will often feel better. Um, and it can be very rapid onset and the types of foods that set it off are really different than the type of foods that set off, um, IBS. And so, you know, for example, like a lot of IBS people do better with, you know, lower FODMAP foods like, you know, spinach and tomato and Parmesan cheese. Well, these are all really high histamine foods and your histamine patients are actually going to feel worse with those foods or have identified those as triggers. Whereas some of the low histamine foods like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts will feel really safe for your histamine patients. And very few IBS people will be like, oh, my safe food is Brussels sprouts. I always feel awesome when I eat Brussels sprouts, right? They will never say that to you. And then as far as malabsorptive diarrhea from either inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency, it's actually much easier to differentiate these from IBS because there's often weight loss. There's often nutritional deficiencies. There may be waking overnight to defecate. Um, they don't respond to low FODMAP. They don't respond to IBS medications. There may be indications of oily, fatty, you know, steatorrhea type of stools. Um, and so these are actually somewhat easier to tell apart because these patients are generally much sicker. 
Um, and it's not just certain times of day or certain foods, like they're chronically malabsorbing or chronically inflamed and they're chronically symptomatic. Um, and there's really no safe diet for them. So understanding now, kind of switching gears, that there's so many different causes and pathophysiologies for chronic diarrhea, you can understand that there's not just like one diet for diarrhea. Like, oh, you have chronic diarrhea? Like, don't eat fiber. Like, that doesn't help somebody at all who has, you know, CSID because they could be on a completely fiberless diet full of sugar and, you know, pooping their brains out. And so you don't just want to throw spaghetti against a wall and see what sticks. You should have a hypothesis. And what do I think this is? And try the very tailored medical nutrition therapy for what you think is going on with the patient if they can't be tested or if you don't have test results. Um, and, you know, you will know within a week of getting the diet right, whether they're better. Chronic diarrhea responds really, really quickly to the right treatment. So for diarrhea predominant IBS, there's no one single IBS diet. There's several approaches that are evidence-based that have shown to be helpful. So you really need to look at the patient in front of you, see what their symptoms are, see what their typical diet looks like, and figure out like what do you think that is going to work best for them. And so the types of approaches can be you know, one or both of the interventions that formulate the NICE guidelines, which is sort of like small meals rather than big meals, not too high in fat, you know, avoiding sort of like these known GI stimulants like coffee and alcohol, which we talked about, sugar alcohols, which we talked about causing osmotic diarrhea. And these are kind of like the, the quote unquote nice diet guidelines, which has some good evidence that they can be helpful for IBSD. There's an approach that we use a lot in our practice that we call soluble fiber therapy, which is manipulating the balance of roughage or insoluble, bulky, coarse, stimulating fiber that kind of quickens GI transit time and really skewing their fiber intake to soluble fiber, which is more viscous, and it actually slows GI transit time and absorbs liquid. You know, it's water soluble, so it kind of gels and, and holds on to liquid and creates more of a formed stool. So manipulating their fiber balance, less insoluble, more soluble, will often give them a soluble fiber supplement, something like a Benafiber, a Citrusel, Acacia fiber, Guar gum. Um, those are kind of the Eucilium, like these are the soluble fibers that typically can work really well. Um, sometimes we'll do FODMAP restriction if we suspect that a FODMAP is at play, whether because we think they have an IBS trigger or because we suspect they might have SIBO. Um, the FODMAPs that are most likely to cause actual diarrhea are lactose, fructose, and polyols because of the osmotic effect. Fructans and GOS can cause diarrhea, but they're more associated with gas and bloating. Um, here, I just have a little um, screenshot from my first book, The Bloated Belly Whisperer. You know, when you think about sort of like, if I'm not really sure what's going on with my patient, like maybe they have some IBS, maybe they have some SIBO, you know, I think maybe FODMAPs could be an issue, but maybe also fiber is an issue. What I just generally tell people is that the most universally tolerated type of fiber is soluble predominant and low FODMAP. And that's kind of the bottom left circle. Sorry, it should really just be these guys. I don't know why I made that circle so big. Um, and so if you're not really sure, like what are the safest fruits, the safest vegetables, the safest grains, it's kind of like this bottom left corner is sort of like the safe corner to start from. And then you can radiate outward. Oh, well, maybe I don't think FODMAPs are such an issue. So maybe I'll go to soluble fiber rich higher FODMAP. Or maybe I think FODMAPs really are the issue, but soluble insoluble is not. So then maybe I'll go to this whole circle here, but kind of you can start in that corner and then radiate out based on what your what vibes you're getting from your patient. As far as carbohydrate intolerances, and so, you know, you can employ a strategy of avoidance of lactose or fructose, um, or you can employ a strategy of enzymatic supplementation or some combination. And so if you're lactose intolerant, you can either eat lactose-free dairy um, or take a lactase enzyme with lactose-containing dairy, or you can avoid dairy altogether, which I think is unnecessary, but certainly some people choose to do it. Um, an effective dose of lactase has been shown to be between 6,000 and 9,000 ALU per meal. Um, that covers a whole lot of lactose, like probably about 25 grams. So that's a lot of lactose. Um, and these are just foods that I've listed here that are the highest lactose forms of dairy foods that people would either want to avoid or supplement lactase with. Uh, with fructose intolerance, there is an enzyme that's marketed um, called xylose isomerase or glucose isomerase. I... I use it like once or twice a year, if we're being honest, not that like, yeah, there's some people who are fructose intolerant. 
I don't know. I don't use it that often for whatever reason. It's just the occasion doesn't come up. There's not that many foods that are high in fructose. There's not that many people who are like that I encounter in my clinical practice that are like specifically fructose intolerant who don't actually have SIBO. Um, but in theory, um, if you do encounter someone with fructose intolerance, you can buy certain products. Fructate is a product you can order. It's a European product. Fructose Digest, I think, comes out of Australia. Um, and the effective dose um, is about 120 milligrams of enzyme for 25 grams of fructose. And I've written down here, that's about three fructates or two capsules of fructose digest if you have the occasion to use it for those foods that are listed here as being higher in fructose. As far as fructin intolerance, which is kind of your onions, your garlic, most people who think they're gluten intolerant are actually just intolerant to the carbohydrates in wheat, which are fructins. Um, there's not... There's not like enough big studies to really um, identify what the minimum effective dose of um, enzyme for fructin is. Um, fructin hydrolase is an enzyme that is, for example, used in the Fodzyme product. Um, and these are the foods that it would cover. Um, it covers these foods exceedingly well, both in studies that have been conducted by the Fodzyme people, as well as in clinical practice. Um, it typically covers a pretty high dose of these foods. Having said that, I still counsel my patients not to eat inulin, um, just because it is just like the biggest fructin bomb in the world, and it's in so many foods. Um, as an added fiber, as sort of like a low carb sweetener. Um, so I do counsel patients with a fructin intolerance to just avoid added inulin or chicory root whenever possible. But yes, um, you know, fructin hydrolyze will cover inulin at, you know, a pretty significant dose. But I don't know, you could eat your, you could eat a whole lot of halo top and maybe <laughs> out eat a fodzyme. So I just, I caution, you know, not eating too much inulin for those people. Um, and GOS, galacto-oligosaccharide intolerance, there's enzymes, Bino, Beanzyme, you know, alpha-galactosidase. Um, a lot of enzymes that people will buy, sort of like the standard digestive enzymes that are kind of like have 50 different, en not 50, but like 10 different enzymes in them, may not have minimally effective doses of lactase or alpha-galactosidase because they have all these other things that you don't need. They have like protease for protein. Like nobody's having diarrhea because they malabsorb protein. And yet these pills have so much other nonsense stuff that they don't actually have effective doses of the important stuff. So I really recommend if people are going to do like an enzyme supplement or enzyme cocktail to choose ones that are very specifically tailored to the things that they malabsorb so that they're getting the maximum dose of what they need and not you know, underdosing what they need and just taking a bunch of nonsense. And so a lot of the standard digestive enzymes I find pretty useless or not really well tailored. Um, you know, kind of if your patient specifically has like a FODMAP intolerance, you should be giving them a FODMAP targeted enzyme um, that has sort of what they need at the maximum levels. Um, for sucrose intolerance, there's a prescription enzyme called Sucrade um, that a doctor would have to order. Um, it covers a lot of sucrose. We do not generally recommend low sucrose diets because as you can see from this list, it's not just like, oh, don't eat dessert or don't drink soda. There are so many vegetables and fruits and beans and root vegetables that have sucrose in them that really these patients should be offered the enzyme rather than a strategy of avoidance. Um, and like I said, that is a prescription enzyme that your doctor would have to order on the basis of a positive breath test or um, the disaccharides assays. Um, there's no, as of yet, enzyme for polyol. So if you establish from kind of uh, elimination and rechallenging that your patient has an issue with sugar alcohols, they should avoid these or polyols, I should say. This is just a list of all the foods that have the different sugar alcohols. You may see in your practice patients that are more sensitive to say sorbitol than mannitol or mannitol versus sorbitol. So it's possible that they'll do okay with one, you know, and not the other. Like I have plenty of patients who can eat avocado, but like the mannitol, like cauliflower and sweet potatoes, like just like run right through them. Um, so, you know, being just mindful that a strategy of avoidance or minimizing polyols may be important for people with chronic diarrhea because we don't have enzymes for those yet. As far as SIBO goes, there is no standard medical nutrition therapy that is evidence-based. As much as we've studied the low FODMAP diet, nobody's actually studied it for SIBO as like a primary intervention and compared it to other types of diets. In clinical practice, it's the most used one because you know, anecdotally, and I think most dietitians would agree with this, that most people with SIBO do better on a low FODMAP diet than not. Some people don't respond to it. I've seen that. Some people with SIBO just do much better on low carb diets. Um, 
in clinical practice, you might see some dietitians doing a specific carbohydrate diet combined with a low FODMAP diet. They might call it, call it a SIBO diet or a biphasic diet. In my my personal opinion and my experience, I think it's ex excessively restrictive for most people. Most people with SIBO do fine with rice, potatoes, sugar, um, and I don't feel the need to be excessively restrictive. And an elemental diet is not something that I recommend. I know that it's popular in certain circles of the internet and of the you know naturopathic world. It's based on one study 15 years ago where a group of people with SIBO were given an elemental diet and one day after they had a negative breath test, but nobody ever followed up two days after they started eating food again, did they still have a negative breath test? So to be eating only elemental formulas for a month, only for your SIBO to come back two days later, I think is extremely cumbersome to ask somebody to do. Diet does not cure SIBO. Diet does not prevent SIBO recurrence as far as anybody has shown. Nobody studied that. The role of diet with SIBO is to manage symptoms. My personal philosophy is the most minimally restrictive diet that I can offer you to manage your SIBO symptoms is the diet that I'm going to recommend for you, especially if you have a history of disordered eating. If I have a patient with an eating disorder or a history of disordered eating, I might not even take any food away from them. I might just give them like a FODZYME or like a FODMAP targeted enzyme to see if I can just manage their symptoms without diet restriction because I really don't want to trigger an eating disorder. For bile acid diarrhea, there is no medical nutrition therapy. Your body is malabsorbing a, a digestive fluid that you cannot control with diet. Lower fat might take the edge off the severity of the symptoms. So if they go like super duper high fat, they might be a lot worse, but it's not like going low fat cures them. It's just less bad. These patients need to be offered medically from a doctor, a bile acid binding medication, cholestyramine, cholestopol, colocevalum. Um, and you have to kind of figure out dosing. Usually they're taken more than once a day, like a small dose twice a day or three times a day before meals. And um, they really need to be tied to meals. There's no point in taking it before bed and then fasting for 14 hours. Like you need to take it before meals to bind the bile acids that are about to be secreted as part of the digestive process. Um, they also should be separated by essential medications, ideally, ideally by four hours. You don't want them to bind up somebody's thyroid medication or their birth control. If somebody's using a digestive enzyme supplement that has actual bile in it, discontinue. For histamine intolerance, we recommend low histamine diets. Um, this is ish, the best version of a low histamine diet that I can offer you. It's very difficult to measure histamine in food. We don't have enough primary sources for every single food to, to know precisely, and sometimes the data are conflicting. This diet is good enough. My patients do really well on it if they are histamine intolerant. Um, so this is the version of the diet that I am currently using. Um, there are also, I should say, DAO enzymes or diamine oxidase enzymes that help people degrade histamine in the gut faster. You can order those on Amazon or online. Um, and so patients who are histamine intolerant might use DAO enzymes if they're going to eat a higher histamine food just to help their body break it down and flush it out faster. And so that's also an option as well, DAO enzymes. Um, for inflammatory bowel disease, you know, diet... Um, has a, a good role as an adjunct of therapy. In other words, people on medication who, um, who adopt sort of an anti-inflammatory diet pattern do seem to enter clinical remission at higher rates than people who do not change their diet. Um, the two anti-inflammatory diet patterns that have been studied for Crohn's disease have been the Mediterranean diet and the specific carbohydrate diet. These diets have been shown to be pretty much identical in terms of you know, inducing remission for about 35 to 40% of people who adopt them with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. Um, because the Mediterranean diet is less restrictive than the specific carbohydrate diet, that's the one that I default to. Um, there is partial enteral nutrition, you know, kind of replacing, you know, 600 calories a day or, you know, one to two meals per day with just like a, you know, an oral supplement um, can also be helpful in, in helping with achieving remission with Crohn's disease. Um, and so those are the anti-inflammatory diet patterns. If somebody is having a lot of diarrhea, they may feel better doing softer forms of fiber and not like salads and skins and peels, but sort of cooked stuff, skinless stuff, more soluble fiber stuff. 
Um, there's also some evidence to suggest that certain food additives might be best to minimize. And so I offered you a list here. These are the IOIBD guidelines or the Institute, no, the International Organization um, for Inflammatory Bowel Disease. These are their guidelines that are published and you can get them on PubMed. Um, and also in addition to avoiding these food additives, they talk about limiting saturated fat. So red meat, whole dairy, you know, palm oil, coconut oil, and also processed meats. And then if someone with IBD has a history of strictures and obstruction, you really want to watch out for intact, bulky, coarse fiber that could actually block them and obstruct them. So cooking instead of rawing, peeling, rawing, that's not a word, peeling things, doing more soluble fiber, less insoluble fiber. And if they want to eat greens and spinach, taking the particle size down to nothing by putting it in the Vitamix or a blender to puree it um, so that they're less likely to obstruct on the coarse fiber. Real quick in terms of pancreatic insufficiency, so if somebody has EPI um, and their pancreas is not making enough enzymes, then the therapy is to supplement pancreatic enzymes. Um, rather than restricting dietary fat, just as somebody with, you know, type 1 diabetes just takes insulin to cover their carbs, someone with EPI takes enzymes to cover their fat. Often the doctor or the company will be like, take two with your meat, like two with a a snack and three with a meal or one with a snack and two with a meal. Well, I mean, if your meal is like a super fatty, fatty, fatty meal, two might not cover it. <laughs> and if the snack has like zero fat grams, you might not need an enzyme at all. You don't need a pancreatic enzyme for a lollipop or for apple juice because there's no fat in it. So in our practice, we really do try to help patients learn how to titrate their enzyme dosing to the amount of fat in a meal. That's really important because these pills can be really big and there can be a lot of pill fatigue and patients will sometimes just skip it because they don't want to deal. And so making them take enzymes that they don't need to take is not great. Um, the rule of thumb that we do in our practice is 16,000 units of lipase to cover about seven grams of fat. And you can go up and down from there. So for example, if someone's on Creon 24, that's 24,000 units of lipase. Divide that by 16,000, multiply that by seven, and that tells you how many pills that they need to take. Um, you don't need to use PERT for fat-free meals or snacks that are pure sugar or simple starches. These patients will also benefit many times from water-soluble versions of fat-soluble vitamins and that, you know, in the U.S. it's marketed as DECAs. Um, and if they're really underweight and losing weight and having a hard time with absorption, median chain triglycerides are um, absorbable fats that don't require enzymes. So that takes me to the full hour. Sorry, I was a little bit behind, but, you know, in practice applications, you know, making sure that you are so detailed with your food and symptom history and that you are really probing on those, some of those distinguishing factors that will help you figure out what are the likeliest causes of diarrhea that I want to really pick an intervention around, um, then try something. You're not going to hurt a patient by trying a diet or an enzyme or, you know, a protocol like this. You'll know within a week if it's helping. So even if you're not hundred percent sure, if you've got an educated guess based Based on what they've told you and based on this conversation, try something. If they respond, then you know you're onto something. You can ask for some testing or some treatment from a doctor. And if they don't respond, that's also data. You've learned something and you move on to your next guess. Um, so lack of response can also help you figure it out. And that happens all the time to me still after all these years. Um, and just be aware that if your patient with chronic diarrhea is actually having alarm symptoms, blood in the stool, they're losing weight, they're having nutritional deficiencies, they're waking overnight, they're having symptoms like joint pain, like, or, you know, or rashes throughout the body, they should also be seeing a doctor, like not just a dietitian. Um, so that is, that's it. Um, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Tamara. That was truly, truly fantastic. We have a lot of really great questions. Um, we also have a few inquiries about the um, webinar recording and the slides. So again, the recording will be sent uh, after this following its um, hopeful approval by the CDR for a recorded CEU. We're not um, sharing the slides, but um, I'll kind of open the floor, Tamara, for you to share a little bit about where um, they can learn more from you and other resources you have. Sure. So literally every single thing I said in this presentation is written in my book, Regular in a different way, right? The regular is written not necessarily for clinicians. So I don't talk about like osmotic mechanisms and like secretory cytokines. Like I don't get into like as much pathophysiology, but 
there's a quiz which kind of mimics some of the differentiating questions. And, you know, there's a chapter for histamine intolerance, a chapter for carbohydrate intolerance, a chapter for IBD. So if you want to go deep on any of these topics, like I literally like, you know, really expound upon this in my book regular and you'll get answers or, and you can learn more and use that as like an ongoing reference, um, the, the prose form of these slides. And so, you know, that has a lot more information, um, you know, and, you know, Google any, like my name, Tamara, and literally any possible GI symptoms, chances are I've probably written an article for US News about it. Um, I have probably 300 articles on US News about like every digestive issue you can imagine. So if you just Google my name and like, why does seltzer bloat me, Tamara? Like I've written about it. Why does airplane travel bloat me, Tamara? I've written about it. So that's also a really good place to start. Great, thank you. Um, here we have a question from Barbara um, asking, please discuss tenesmus. So maybe you could give an overview and any interventions you're able to offer these patients. So tenesmus is sort of like this constant feeling like you have to go that you don't actually have to go. And it's sort of like, almost like spasmy, sort of like a rectal spasm or an anal spasm. Um, and a lot of patients with um, uh, ulcerative proctitis, which is an inflammation of, you know, the, the anus and rectum, which is sort of like a version of ulcerative colitis will have tenesmus, or maybe sometimes you'll see it in patients who have like, you know, radiation enteritis or like severe, like injuries, like childbirth injuries from like episiotomy or something. Tenesmus is not a dietary condition that we can treat as dietitians. Um, it's really generally like going to be treated by a physician. Um, sometimes like if you can really help them with complete bowel emptying like like a fiber con like sometimes when there's like zero stool in the rectum whatsoever they might be prone to less tenesmus so you can kind of try like maybe like a bulking fiber supplement like a fiber con but tenesmus is not necessarily going to be something that has a dietary solution thank you super helpful um, here, our next question is about um, C. difficile. What about um, dietary interventions could we offer these patients? So C. diff is an acute diarrhea. It's not a chronic, I mean, it can't become chronic if you don't catch it, but it's infectious. C. diff needs antibiotics and in worst case scenarios, a stool transplant. There's no diet that's going to cure C. diff and C. diff is one of those things that you could change your diet all you want. You're probably still having diarrhea because you have an acute GI infection. You know, Floristor can be helpful in, you know, kind of competitive inhibition of C. diff, which is a probiotic, a yeast-based probiotic. Floristor might be something helpful for someone who's had C. diff and is at risk for recurrence and wants to prevent recurrence. But C. diff is not a dietary cure. And if, you know, often you'll know someone has C. diff because they're not responding to any diet you recommend and they're losing weight and they're sick as a dog and their stool smells like the worst possible, most disgusting thing ever. Um, C. diff is not something that you as a dietitian are going to be able to fix with a diet. Thank you. Great. Um, here's another really good question. Um, asking for your thoughts on allulose as a non-caloric sweetener. Are there issues um, with this as well as, um, you know, any advice you could offer um, on oh, how to- Oh my God. I love this question. And I completely struggled with this question when I was writing my book regular and I have like a 10 paragraph footnote about allulose in my carbohydrate intolerance charts. So here's a deal on allulose. They claim that, you know, allulose is like, it's non, it's well absorbed, but it's, you know, non-caloric. And so the reason that it has no calories isn't because we malabsorb it like a sugar alcohol. We absorb it. It's just that the cells can't metabolize it and turn it into energy. So that's why they say allulose is kind of different as a low calorie natural sweetener. Fine. But if you actually go into the literature and you see, well, how does the body absorb allulose mechanistically? It's through the GLUT5 transporter, which is the same transporter that fructose is absorbed by. Theoretically, allulose intolerance should therefore be at the same prevalence as fructose intolerance. Anyone who doesn't have enough GLUT5 transporters to absorb fructose, in theory, should also not absorb allulose. And if allulose is osmotically active, as I think it should be, in theory, allulose and fructose intolerance should travel hand in hand. This is my hypothesis based on what I understand allulose mechanistically, how it's absorbed into the body. I don't know that anybody has studied whether allulose and fructose intolerance go hand in hand, but from my perspective, allulose, I view with a little bit of like side eye. In other words, like I'm skeptical of it. I'm nervous about it in terms of an osmotic diarrhea in the same way that I would be looking out for fructose as a potential issue. 
I'm also thinking allulose in that same category based on a hypothesis of how I understand it's absorbed. It has not been studied, I think, enough to prove whether I'm right or not. Thank you. Certainly great explanation. I know we're all waiting for a lot more research in that area. Um, here we have a great question from Emmy um, asking, you mentioned there are possible components of beer that could cause osmotic diarrhea. What are these? So sucrose and fructans. And so certain types of um, um, like craft beers and certain types of like ales will be like much higher in sucrose or have some more fructans. And so like sometimes people will be like, I can drink Miller Lite or Bud Light, no problem. But oh my God, when I go out for like, you know, you know, like craft beers or like this like small little microbrewery, like I get the weirdest shits the next day and I don't know why. Um, so sometimes patients will tell you that they have like different reactions to different types of beer. Thank you. Um, here we have a question around um, why an enzyme with fructose when fructose is a monosaccharide and the issue with transporters. So maybe you could explain a little bit about the mechanism behind yeah. um, fructose targeting enzymes. Yeah, so the xylose isomerase or glucose isomerase, what it does is it takes fructose and turns it into glucose. So it literally changes fructose to glucose and you don't need special transporters or enzymes to absorb. Well, I guess you need transporters for glucose, but like nobody's deficient in those from what I understand. Um, so that's why it works. Thank you. Great. Um, here's one on the topic of SIBO. So how do you approach SIBO with the low FODMAP diet? Do you prefer to have patients do it before antibiotic treatment or after if symptoms remain after the treatment? So it kind of depends like where they are in their process. Like if they've already been tested for SIBO and they've like, they're two days into the antibiotic by the time they see me, which sometimes happens, I'm kind of like, like, why would I even bother at this point? <laughs> like, not that I wouldn't, but like my decision criteria is much more based on like, how soon are we getting relief? Right. Like if I think you have SIBO, but you still haven't even been tested and we don't even have a doctor yet. And like, it's going to be a while to you're on antibiotics. I'm definitely putting you on a low FODMAP diet for symptom management. If you've been tested, you've already started antibiotics. I'll ask them, I'm like, do you want to change your diet for the next week and a half until we're sure that your antibiotics are kind of complete and you're feeling better? If you want to, let's do it. And if you're like, well, you know, I'm already feeling so much better after three days in the antibiotic. I'm like, why would I bother? Um, so it kind of depends. Um, but if they do start it before they've been tested or before they've been treated, I will, I really want them to kind of try to go off of it within a couple of days of stopping the antibiotic because if they start to react immediately to FODMAPs once they introduce them, then I'm kind of thinking maybe the antibiotic didn't do the job. And if they're like, oh my God, like, you know, three days after finishing my antibiotic, I tried, you know, some cauliflower and like, I felt fine. That's great evidence to me as their dietitian that like, okay, it looks like the antibiotics did their job and like they worked. And so if you stay on, and on low FODMAP indefinitely after antibiotics, we can't really get a good read as to whether you're better. So my personal preference is to kind of really reintroduce soon after treatment to see whether your treatment worked. You know, I know that a lot of doctors for whatever reason say like, oh, you should stay on the low FODMAP diet for a month after treatment. There's no evidence to show that staying on a low FODMAP diet after treatment increases the chances that the treatment will work or will improve your chances that you won't get a SIBO recurrence. So there's literally no evidence to support that. So anyone making that recommendation, that's their belief system. That's their their religion, their ideology, their philosophy, it's not evidence-based practice. And so there's no rules about when or whether to do low FODMAP elimination or introduction. It is all everyone's personal beliefs and practices that we're all doing on our own. There's no guidelines around or evidence around any of this. Thank you. So helpful to know. And I know we're all really eagerly awaiting more research in this area as well. Um, we are, you know, over time. So I think that will be our last question. Um, but thank you all truly for all of the fantastic questions we've had in here and for joining live. Um, as we mentioned, we'll send around the link to this recording um, after the CDR approval. Um, and with that, really want to thank Tamara for sharing her deep, deep expertise, knowledge with us um, today. And really, um, we'll let you all get back to your days. But thank you. Yeah, tomorrow, there, tomorrow, there is one question in there that I thought you could answer just to wrap up. Where can they find your books? Oh, well, I, I mean, I went to Barnes and Noble yesterday. I didn't find either of them. So probably Amazon, to be honest. <laughs> uh, Amazon is the best place to find them, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't guarantee that your local bookstore has them. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Tamara. And thank you, everyone, for joining.